Thank you very much. I want to make sure that I thank Electromate for the opportunity to share some technology information with you. This has been a great venue. The, uh, the guests have been really informative, and I'm happy to be a part of the team here to present. I do want to say that uh, Cole Morgan, as a company, we actually last year celebrated our 100th anniversary. For, uh, since World War II, we've been developing motor architectures for military aerospace, commercial, medical, virtually all fields. We are from, from two miles deep in the ocean with uh, powered robotic systems and uh, underwater research vehicles and ROVs for the oil and gas industry. We have, uh, we have motors that are on Mars, as you'll see, on the space station. Uh, we were on the uh, lunar rover program in the 60s. We have a long-standing history of providing electromechanical systems using and basically taking magnetics to the best advantage of, of systems here. One of the things we're going to talk about, and kind of the core DNA that we have, is to try and take our motion technology, the motors, drives, control systems, and allow innovators like yourselves to literally create a better place in the world. One of the ways we're talking about this Let's, uh, let's do a simple review of what we're going to try and talk about. Why are we here? Why frameless motors specifically make a difference? I'm not talking about conventional servos today. I'm talking about motors that come to you in pieces and parts, sometimes known as kit motors. We'll talk about the different kinds of topologies that these motion systems, these motors will deal with. We'll talk about some important technical concepts of the motors themselves. And the technology information I'll talk about motors will translate not just to the frameless motor elements, but also to conventional servo motors and motor architectures as well. We'll talk about some application review, different styles of applications in the robotic space, and then I'll take a deeper dive into one specific application, which will be a look at collaborative robotic joint motor systems and some of the defining elements of uh, system design that create that. And then some things that we've done to try and optimize the performance around that very, very difficult and interesting space. So why are we here? The industrial robotics marketplace, primarily as a result of one national effort from the Chinese, the Made in China 2025 initiative basically is going to take China from being a low-cost region of manufacturing. Their goal is to create the highest tech workspace in the world. Already, with the, uh, they are suffering from low labor availability at reasonable prices relative to where they want their market to be, and they are outsourcing much of China's business now to other Southeast Asian countries, specifically uh, Vietnam and others. So China is going to create, by the end of this decade, it is said by some of the, uh, the people that know these things in the marketing space, 400,000 robots by the end of next year is the pace that they will be on. That's remarkable. If you take a look at countries like Korea, there are in excess of 100 robots in place today for every 10,000 people in the labor force. And China wants to aspire. The average, by the way, in the world is 69 robots in place per 10,000 people. And it is countries like Singapore and Korea and the like, where you have relatively narrow population bases, that this is the kind of architecture that makes sense, driving this kind of technology with robotics to advantage them in worldwide manufacturing prowess. They see this as a $30 billion market. By the way, out of those robots that will be sold in China, into China, they say that 40% of that will come from outside of China. So just because they're building their own robots in China doesn't mean that we're going to be shut out globally. In fact, there will be a, the highest level of innovation will probably still be brought to bear on those robots that will be delivered there. Why frameless motors? The performance advantage of conventional servo architectures typically have some kind of a gearbox, a shaft or coupling, an element that creates lost motion, compliance, additional friction, higher parts counts, all those elements oftentimes lead to the reduction of performance benefit that a servo-driven opportunity can create. When you have a frameless system, you directly couple this particular rotor, the rotating magnet portion of a frameless motor, 
literally just gets attached to the shaft of a mechanism itself. You already know on your machine what the dynamics of the shaft response have to be. You understand what the TIR requirements are. You understand how your bearing sets have to be placed. You understand how those load create the opportunity for you to command that motion shaft. What we have to do is find a way to put this physical piece onto that same shaft. This is the inertia that is reflected back to your, in, in the system. This rotating portion of the motor itself is really the inertia that goes to the system. Then beyond that, we mount this in proximity to that rotor component. And most people say, I don't want to be in the, uh, I don't want to be in the motor business. When you get a chance later, stop back to the table, and I'm going to pull this back and forth, side to side. On this relatively small diameter motor, you can hear that, that's 25 thousandths of an inch of air gap on each side. 50 thousandths of an inch in, in gap, which is something people, they say, I don't want to have to do all the precision. Usually the precision of your shaft, the one or one and a half or two thousandths TIR that you're running on your existing shaft development, you are way ahead of the game of what we need to make a properly compliant system with an, an embedded motion solution. If we're in the order of three to four thousandths TIR, we're in great shape. So it is not going to be us that's going to drive the tolerancing in your components or parts. So smallest possible footprint, minimal weight, reduce maintenance by getting rid of those parts counts, and the overall system efficiency and the performance and bandwidth of your system is, is critical. Uh, we don't really have time to go into a lot of why frameless is. I want to dive into some more technology issues. Let's take a look. Of, there are generally two different types of frameless motors. You'll find that the classic torquer motor, also known as a pancake motor, it was developed primarily after World War II when, they, when the Navy wanted to have a gunfire control platform. If you remember, it used to be in the old days, they'd have a cannon, the ship would be in the waves, and the, your gunner would have to be the guy. He'd know exactly when to fire to make sure it worked. Well, it turns out that after World War II, MIT and the US Navy got together with our company, and we developed the motors that automatically did the gunfire control systems and modified the, the future. Actually, it put the, uh, it put the people that made the ammunition out of business almost because they, all those test rounds that they used to fire, they didn't fire anymore. So it turns out that in these systems, what we've got is we've got the ability to look at rotating, rotating portion, stationary portion, are similar whether it's a long skinny motor like a conventional servo or the pancake style. Let's dive in a little deeper. What characterizes this typical torque style motor is a very large rotor through bore. Also a relatively high pull count or the number of magnets. Oftentimes you'll talk about the, uh, the pull count or pull pair count of a design. Literally count the magnets on the shaft. That's the pull count and the number of pull pairs divide by two. It's pretty straightforward. Normally we can get a very thin OD to ID cross section in these. You have a generally large outside diameter relatively short axial stack length. When I'm looking at more conventional designs, actually this, this just shows the uh, graphic of two, four, and eight pole pairs. Pretty, uh, pretty rough looking motor there, but... Turns out that in the more conventional servo style shape, and this would be the same architecture you'd find in conventional servo motors, the you know black square kind of motors with flange fronts on them. Um, it turns out that there, we literally will take some of the guts of our conventional high-performance servos and embed them into frameless packages. Now we can take the advantages of these high power density style motors and apply them into applications such as spindles. I have motors that are frameless that are in excess of 20,000 RPM, which is non-traditional for a frameless style motor execution. Um, also, these kinds of motors I have the ability to deal with up to six or seven hundred volts DC bus. The insulation systems are actually designed around about a 1400 volt uh, total insulation package. So the reliability, even in high voltage applications, is quite sound. It turns out that some of the differences here, oh, gotta go backwards here. Some of the differences here, you'll find that they are generally much longer in axial stack length typically smaller armature ODs, 
And because of that smaller diameter, we're seeing substantially smaller pole counts. This is part of what allows the motor system to drive to higher speeds with a natural frequency, the magnetic commutation frequency being, uh, being substantially lower at speed. So it turns out there are some basic parameters when comparing torquer style motors to conventional servo style architectures. Normally the torquers are relatively slow. Typically the application speeds are under 2,000 RPM. We do have we do have torquer style motors like this that go in excess of 4,000 RPM, but in general they're lower speed applications. The um, servo motors generally never operate below 1,000 RPM, or, or in general don't, except when they're stopping. It turns out that I can get in excess of 20,000 RPM with that style system. Where you have, where you have the need for rapid excel decel, uh, and very fast motion requirements versus the slow, precise, very, uh, uh, very high torque, highly stable style systems. This is generally where the differentiators are for the applications. Continuous torque for these t torquer style motors is quite high usually. In fact, uh, we can see as much as five to six times peak, uh, five to six times continuous for peak numbers on these kinds of systems. Typically in servo motors, you're looking at more like three to four times uh, continuous to peak relationships. Um, I think that this is probably one of the most important rules that we can talk about. When you're sizing a servo motor for an application, whether it's robotics or whether it's conventional industrial applications, you always want to try and optimize that performance based on the requirement you have. The D squared L rule, which we kind of call out, is that if I go out and I take a conventional motor, and I double the axial length of the motor, double that stack length, I'm going to get about nominally about twice the torque. There's going to be some losses associated with the additional core, the additional copper wire, and, and losses there. But in general, I've got a nominal doubling of the amount of torque I'm going to have available. If, however, I take a look at my machine, and I say, you know what? I'm going to look at doubling the diameter. It turns out that by doubling the diameter of the moment arm that you have there, you get the squared function of the increase in the amount of torque. So double that moment arm, and now you've got four times the torque. What that means to you as a designer of a motion or robotic system is that take into account the largest practical diameter that your mechanism will allow. By optimizing it to diameter first, you will allow yourself the most torque and then you can also start from as compact an axial form factor as possible. This will also help minimize weight. Now, this, of course, is in highly intensive torque style, torque dense applications. One of the downsides of dealing with this style of motor is that you have relatively high inertia. And as, uh, as Max talked before earlier today, Oftentimes, the applications are all about very, very rapid acceleration. As you can guess, a large diameter device like this is not going to be meant for extremely fast, extremely high uh, acceleration rate in the applications. Really, it's more around torque and taking the advantage of the uh, high torque density. So let's take a look at a couple of the, uh, the equations that drive you're, when you go to look at a motor, you're going to see some typical specifications. One of the key specifications you're going to want to look at is what is the K sub T? What is the torque constant? Basically what this says is you know you've got an amplifier. By the way, with those amplifiers, make sure you understand that the amount of current that you have at a given voltage, is it in DC ratings or is it in RMS ratings? Is the voltage you're looking at? Let's talk, for example, on, on RMS versus DC. In, if I have uh, a K sub T, which is simply my units of torque divided by the units of current, how much torque am I going to get for a certain amount of current from my amplifier? And the ratings of an amplifier, in our case, we rate all of our amplifiers on RMS current. So if I have a, if I have a 7.1 amp continuous current capability, that would look like a 10 amp DC rated amplifier because it would be the RMS characteristic of it. So always make sure that you've got the right terminology and the right, uh, the, the right units when you're dealing with amplifier design. It's important to know because if you have to have a certain compact factor for your amplifier or if you're trying to deal with certain power stages, you want to make sure that you have the right 
torque constant, or the right amount of torque generating capacity per amp that's available in your drive system. And how we determine what that KT, the torque constant is, is by the number of turns in each of the laminated stacks that we have. So those turns per coil is one of the means by which we do that. There are other levers that we pull in terms of changing the dynamics. We change the air gap, the distance between the magnet and the teeth of the uh, stator. We, we look at how much uh, magnetic flux we can actually put into engagement to create torque in the system. And those elements, along with about six or seven other things, is what creates the changes we have when we go to make a motor. How does the back EMF constant, which is a term you also look at when you're looking for a motor design, how does that relate to the torque constant? Well, in reality, they're one and the same. They are exactly the same thing. It happens that this is just a voltage function. If you, do, if you look in SI units, you look in SI units, the value that you have for K sub E, the back EMF constant, and the K sub T are exactly the same number. Realistically, it's just a different way to express the same variability. How, mu how many volts does it take for me to achieve a certain number of RPM in the application? So when you're dealing with these kinds of things, torque constant or voltage constant, the back EMF constant, know that, again, it's highly dependent on what units of measure that you're trying to deal with. And know that there are variations in how you can optimize the windings for these applications to suit specifically the amplifier, the bus voltage, and the configuration that your system design is, is re recommending. K sub M. This is, one of the, uh, this is one of the tricky ones. Oftentimes we see people are making uh, specsmanship games out of how they rate their motors. Oftentimes when you see a motor rated, it'll say there's so many, there's so many, uh, uh, ounce inches or foot pounds or newton meters of torque that can be created. Oh, and by the way, you need to put a certain uh, heat sink size in order to gain this particular value. There are values that people say, and because the K sub M or the, what we call the motor constant is out there, it turns out that this is a very specific number. There is no changing the numbers and the dynamics of what this, what this will do. There are other ways that they play games to give you the actual torque capacity of a motor. This is all about the torque that's produced as a function of the heat in the motor system. So that KM factor talks about how much torque the particular motor will be able to influence what the capacity of that motor is based on the physical attributes of the size, the amount of mass it has in the copper and the steel in the system. Uh, it turns out that uh, the efficiency will also dictate what influences in those applications. We're going to try and get into a little bit more detail. Let me talk about this here. So if you have a, a non-optimized system design, the amount of power or the watts in to the motor are going to be seeing reduced by these two functions, both frequency losses and I squared R losses. And we'll talk us quickly to those application pages. This manifests itself in heat, the loss of energy directly to, the, to heat, and then the actual power output is shown. If you can optimize a system by changing some of the dynamics of the design, you may reduce the IR, I squared R losses or the frequency losses and gain this kind of efficiency in the design. When you buy a motor from a, a manufacturer, they have already assumed the kinds of efficiencies that you and your application might have. It may not be directly proportional to your real needs. So as a result, it is often a good idea to take a look, especially if you're in a volume application, to try and optimize the amount of, the amount of uh, power you're going to have to put in. But maybe more importantly, especially in robotics applications where there, are, where there is harmonic drive style gearing involved, the thermal aspects of motor design are highly critical. Any losses you have in the form of heat like this manifest themselves not just in power loss performance, but also in life expectancy losses associated with designs simply because of lubrication and other, delight, other, other wear characteristics in the system and simply how far, how far that system will be able to go with, uh, with performance at, at temperature. So I squared R losses, basically it's copper losses. When we put, when we put a current to flow through the windings of a, of, a, of a motor winding, what you'll see is that there is a resistance that 
as a function of the amount of current it takes, let's see if I can get that up there, the amount of current it takes, you see heat losses. Why is that important? Many of the applications you're looking at right now are 48 volt or low voltage. Whether they're battery operated or trying to develop a machine that gets in under the low voltage directives, it's critical to try and maximize the voltage you've got so that you can reduce the amount of current. There are so many watts that are required to create motion in your application. The higher the bus voltage that you can drive to, the lower the current will be. What do the copper losses look like? What are they a function of? They're a function of the square of the current. Maximize your system by driving to as high a bus voltage as you can get. 48 volts is a nominal right now. A lot of people have historically come into and have 24 volt systems. Anytime I come to an application where the folks are looking at DC and trying to get under a low voltage directive, I've, I invariably try and drive them to 48. When they're already at 48, unless they've got a good reason because of some kind of uh, voltage limitation due to compliance in their system or certification requirements, I try and drive them to 72 or I try and drive them to 96 volts. The efficiency of their overall system will be dramatically improved if you can do that, which is why conventional servo motors, conventional servo motors typically drive to the highest bus voltage they can. Globally, we see that most of the high performance servos, even in small NEMA 100 frame sizes and smaller, even those style systems are running at 480 volt on the bus, creating 625 volt DC bus architectures, but the conductor size, the current requirements are substantially reduced for the same wattage that the system sees. So as a result, the cost of cables, the volume of the cables and the cableways, in the case of robotics applications, by dropping that current, the cross-section and weight of the cables that will be involved in driving these applications will be reduced overall performance increases. The takeaway here, reduce those copper losses, increase the bus voltage to the maximum practical that you can. Frequency losses. When you have lamination steel and you are taking, and basically what we're doing is we're creating an electromagnet with a drive amplifier and we are forcing the permanent magnets. By the way, these samples are not magnetized, so you don't have to worry about them. What you're doing is you're creating an electromagnet that is going to force the movement of the permanent magnets to make it so that it rotates in a controlled fashion. It turns out that simply by having that DVDT, the driving of the current in and out of the windings of a motor like this, create losses. The execution of a strong magnetic field, the, the decay of that electromagnetic field, and, the, and doing that thousands of times a second in some cases, depending on the application you're dealing with, those create hysteresis and eddy current losses. So sometimes the iron core losses may be involved in the application, and that has a lot to do with the pole count. Just as you have a nominal induction motor that might have a standard speed with a four-pole induction motor of 3,600 RPM, okay, um, um, sorry, 17, 1800 RPM, and then 3600 RPM for a two pole design. When you get motors that have 16 poles, when you get motors that have hundreds of poles, we have motors that are nine, uh, I'm sorry, three meters in diameter that have hundreds and hundreds of, of permanent magnet poles in them. Okay, these things are actually embedded into the bedrock underneath large scale telescopes in systems. They're built before the building is usually, or they'll actually put the stator and rotor components into place. But it turns out that the largest loss associated with these are when you're trying to operate these kinds of motors at relatively high speeds. And when that pole count is high, those losses are high. So the, the lower the motor factor, the KM, the motor constant, it generally equates to lower pole counts and lower flux density in, in, the, in the motor steel, which results in reducing of those uh, frequency losses. Why that's important is that we end up trying to figure out where on this sliding scale of losses we want to try and have our machine design. And it turns out that when we do this, to maximize the efficiency at a particular speed point or torque speed load point, we often will take a look at trying to balance out the I squared R losses and the frequency losses. So ideally, you might be around 15 to 20 percent of the maximum torque capacity, or 80 to 85% of the maximum speed capacity. 
of the system. By the way, at the end of the day, if you're out there just looking for a conventional motor, somebody's already made those decisions for you. If you have an application that is ultra specific, this is really when you get into how you do, how you pull the levers to change the pole count, how you change the turns, add turns, take away turns in the windings. This is a little bit of the uh, uh, look behind the curtain in terms of how motors have this kind of architecture. And I'm understanding, by the way, too, that these notes will be made available. Okay, I, I'm, we'll, I'll be providing a PDF of this so that you don't have to worry about having notes. And there's actually a few more pages I had to cut out here, too, that'll be in there. So let's take a look at a couple of different applications. Let's take a look at a couple of applications that, have, that are generally, in a, in a very broad way, stuff that we've done. One of the largest applications in the, uh, in the world today is in collaborative space, in articulated collaborative robot designs. And this uh, light blue cap is a very well-known robotic system. We actually have done some joint marketing with these guys, so we are able to talk about, in, in each other's presentations, universal robots, in fact, started working with a Chinese source for their motors. And then five years ago, they found out that uh, there were some downsides to a low-cost region in manufacturing. It turns out that they were experiencing 40% out-of-box failure rate in the stuff that was coming in from overseas. They approached our team in Germany. They then came to work with our team here in uh, the States, in the North America, in Radford, Virginia. And for five years, we have been the sole motor supplier for all of the Universal Robots joints on their three, their five, and their 10 kilogram uh, collaborative style robots. The point here is that even these systems, because we were forced into a uh, direct drop-in replacement in terms of the electromagnetics, we have done many other robotic systems in this space, in collaborative robot space, where we can find ways to optimize. And I'll show you when I dive a little deeper into this specific application, the hows and whys of what you might do and why it's important to take a look at the uh, optimizing the electromagnetics. Surgical robots. It isn't always about just having the smallest motor. In fact, this style of robot uses relatively few motors that I produce and a lot of the kind of motors that Max's company produces, right? And, and there, you, you, know, you talked about tendons before, right? Because that haptic feel, the feel of the surgeon to be able to have a minimal amount of torque perturbation between what's happening at the machine, the machine head element, and what he feels in his hands is critical. But along with that kind of motor comes an issue sometimes of torque density, okay? Power density is one thing, but torque density is another. So it turns out, when you want to have a high degree of torque, now you have to do special things in the motor to minimize the cogging torque. And if you're interested later, I can show you some things that we do very specifically, whether it's anything from skewing the lamination stack to doing a variable air gap design in the magnet structure we deal with. These things are all set up to try and do two things. One, to improve the design for manufacturability of the motors themselves to create a, as good a price point as we can in production, but also to enhance the performance capability. In the case of haptic feel, minimizing the cogging torque while not having to go to a completely ironless core style design, which doesn't have nearly as high a, uh, a torque density. So, surgical robots. The Fukushima nuclear disaster in Japan several years ago created a worldwide awareness of the fact that there are places and times when humans cannot interact with the disasters that happen out there. In Fukushima, a substantial amount of damage could have been controlled at a higher level if we had had non-human entities that could have gone in, climbed over rubble piles, climbed upstairs, opened doors, gone in and turned valves in a manual way, or cut holes in walls to allow for in ingress of people or other machines or robots, or allow for outgassing that was appropriate. It turns out that the, uh, the DARPA program, the US military kind of uh, skunk program stuff, challenged 16 different companies from around the world to develop robots that could go in and become rescue robots. I work closely with the National Robotics Engineering Center in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and Cole Morgan uh, actually has 
30 axes, 30 degrees of freedom. We worked with the NREC team. We worked with that team and developed four different motor frame sizes. And uh, I think I, uh, yeah, this is their joint. This is public knowledge, by the way, in a paper that was produced by NREC. And you can see the sophistication in the application. Sometimes everything from slip ring, absolute encoder on the output, a tw compliant tube for, for a torque transfer, incremental encoder on the motor side. We actually had uh, Hall effect devices in the custom frameless motor, integral brake system, obviously on the motor side to minimize the amount of torque and the opposite side of the gearing, torque limiting clutch system, harm really the key. And uh, by the way, there were two key sponsors for this. One was Cole Morgan, but we have to bow down to the folks at Harmonic Drives. They were the, uh, they were the other top line sponsor. And between Harmonic Drives and Cole Morgan, we helped provide, uh, what was it, about 34 axes total on the, on the primary system? Yeah. Uh, in full disclosure, we donated those. What did you guys do? So <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm sure you guys did your share. Turns out that this is their package, including the drive element on this system. That is about as expensive and non-commercial an application as you can possibly get. But for, the, for what they did, it's a phenomenal piece of engineering work. By the way, there was a team of engineers that was at NREC. The top 15% of those engineers ended up getting bought by a little company called Uber. Okay, and David Rice, who was the head of this program on the mechanical engineering team, been a good friend of mine for a long time. Find, I find out that if you give $120,000 worth of engineering and, th and about 40 free motors away to people, they really like you for a long time. But it, I will say, though, that it turns out that because we were able to bring to bear a greenfield, white, clean sheet of paper design, they were able to optimize. It turns out these guys won millions of dollars in the DARPA challenge and ended up placing third in the DARPA challenge. It was three months before the final event there that they actually had all the motors and everything done. They did all of their modeling in software while all of the other mechanical system components were being designed, built, and tested. And it worked very well. So it, it is kudos to those that can understand the dynamics of modeling. So there are some fun robots that are out there too. You guys have seen Pacific Rim, Pacific Rim 2, 3, 4, whatever those things that are out. I don't know where they're at right now, but this particular, this particular robot, oftentimes it's about getting a system built and running. It turns out these folks in, in Korea, in the Korea uh, Future Technologies Group, these guys just wanted stuff that was off the shelf that they could integrate quickly into their system there are 18 axes of our standard product motors in here simply to do arm, hip, and leg joint right down to the ankles. In fact, I've got a really short clip. I think I can... Uh... I'm not going to give you the sound because it doesn't make that much difference. Look at the guy in there. This thing is 13 and a half feet tall. I'm not so sure that that overhead crane could contain this thing if it did come down. And yet, look at how close some of these guys are to the system. All these little joints that you see that are actively controlled are basically controlled by motors that are within the dynamics of these two sizes. It isn't always just about articulated systems or joints and knees. Sometimes it's about propulsion. And again, sometimes it isn't about having to have a highly customized solution. It turns out the folks at KUKA were, were already using our motors on the articulated arm that was, that's on the body of the, the, but the transport vehicle needed to have propulsion. And so they were able to use conventional servo architectures and apply these conventional servos through c standard gearing practices to drive their system. Again, it was something that they could get quickly, and make something work. By the way, a lot of small startup companies will go out there and they want to do something quickly. It may be because they have to pay their employees. It may be because they have milestones in front of, their, in front of the, the folks that are paying the bills for them. Take the time to engineer the motion solution that makes sense. I had a major, I had a, a, a major manufacturer of robots, specifically of uh, these kinds of carts, come to me at a trade show last year and say, you know what? 
at the time I was doing my, my propulsion system, I needed to have something that worked. Now I'm trying to go backwards and solve the problems that I had originally. And by the way, this is not just one company that says this. What the, what the message learned perhaps should be is that by understanding the dynamics and principles of how to best develop motor architectures, working with, with top suppliers in the industry and people that have the technical capability to support you locally, like Electromate, for example, we can get you the right solutions the first time around. Turns out one of the engineers from Intuitive Surgical ended up going into the agricultural robotics business. The foodborne illness issues that we see, the listeria and the other uh, very bad uh, considerations, it turns out it is human contact that often is the, the creation of the problem. When you deal with foodborne illness, you can do things like take the machinery and try and do super cleaning on it, but if the food itself is coming into the process, has had problems with the people that have been handling it, you've already, you're already behind the eight ball in terms of uh, the considerations for health risk. People are developing right now very specific by species of vegetables and fruit picking systems. We talked a little bit, I know that uh, Max talked today, about the, the haptics and about how the actuators that are being used for doing the picking. I think you had an example of strawberries earlier today. How, how much more delicate could it be than a strawberry and the bruising that might, might occur? These kinds of machines, this happens to be an apple picking machine. I've got dozens of different applications now and everybody is going in and designing very specifically the vision systems, the servo motor systems, and oftentimes it's conventional architectures. Sometimes it's about making it more compact and embedding the motion solution, as you see with frameless motors, into those packages. But we, we, have, we have these kinds of applications to support. By the way, the last time I was out at uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California, we, we've been working for several years now on the 2020 Mars Rover program. This will be the, uh, this will be the uh, uh, third, that will be the fourth. We already have three generations of Mars Rovers with motors on Mars Rovers. And it's both cryogenic pump motors as well as articulated robotic joint motors. So what's different about that? It turns out that whether it's space rated application systems or in the applications where you may have robots that might have to be engaged in <laughs> high vacuum environments, if you're dealing with on the order of 10 to the 7, 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 8 tor, there are very special things that happen and you can't use conventional materials in those motors. You end up having to get rid of some of the cross-link polymers that are in there. And in order to do so, you have to apply what, what we generically have as our space-based recipe. We can apply conventional motor technologies and standard forms that you see in our motors with space-based recipes, and now we can give you a motor that will minimize the outgassing and will, will last in the, in the face of radiation. So a lot of medical robots right now are being put into play, whether it's patient care and the physical movement of patient in proximity to radiation sources, or in terms of the shutters and the, um, the manipulation of blinds, if you will, that allow for the penetration of radiation from these sources. If you're using motors, you're gonna be in proximity there. You have to understand the dynamics of what that radiation looks like and make sure that your motor is gonna last. When somebody said earlier today, and I, I, I think it was Doug talked about uh, the, the radiation, he said that it, uh, the, the impact is negative on motors. It isn't just negative impact. It turns this stuff to mush. And the motor will fall apart, the air gap will close, things, bad things will happen, okay? So uh, if you have radiation, let's, let's talk about that. We also see a lot right now in medical rehab in the systems associated with uh, both prosthetic style joint replacement and in exoskeleton suits. Let's face it, the, uh, the military probably would, would, would benefit from this, but the batteries that it takes and the load and the weight of the battery systems to, to drive this aren't, aren't very conducive to making a, uh, an efficient style system. Where it does make sense though, for example, we took physically this exact motor and we embedded this into an ankle. And so soldiers that are coming back with as lower limb amputees now can have a more natural gait 
in their system by putting robotic ankles into place. Uh, I mean, I saw videos of this one guy that was winning a dance competition with a robotic ankle. This, by the way, is truly the definition of making the world a better place and having innovators like yourselves out there that are creating that kind of value. Okay, let me go back now. Let's do a quick dive because I'm already way beyond my time. And I was told it was somewhat okay if I did that, right, Chris? So, so let's take a look. Let's just say you're trying to design a joint, three, five, 10 kilogram capacity for a collaborative style robot. Speed, really your design limited based on how safe that system has to be. So fundamentally, a collaborative style robot is not gonna have the same rate of execution of movement, it's not gonna have the same payload capacity where you have the stored energy and this load that's gonna hit somebody. And I, 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 won't, I won't say that, uh, there's, there's a reason why there's a cage around non-collaborative style robots. Let's just, we'll put it that way. There's also a thermal management issue, and it's not just around touch proofing. If, if I'm a worker and I have one, two, or perhaps three collaborative style robots in close proximity, physically, a conventional motor architecture for any of these standard size motors generally runs at an optimized thermal point in these windings of 155 degrees C. That's nominal. It turns out the insulation system we design is 180 degree C, which gives us a little bit more life expectancy, a little bit, little bit higher performance potential. But in close proximity to that 155 C at an optimized motor winding, I'm only gonna see about 20 degrees C of temperature drop. Even with a fairly good heat sink and the application, I have to be aware of what is going to happen is it going to be appropriate for me to be working right next to a motor joint that if I don't protect it, some kind of thermal shielding or some fans or something else to reduce that temperature, is that going to be valid as a state for me to have the potential for a touch to burn? No. So we do some things there. The other thing is that when you have gearing, especially the high quality gearing sets you have with folks like the harmonic drive style gears, be very sure to look at the technical specifications for these and understand the dynamics of the lubrication requirements and the temperature limitations. The efficiency of these systems, as outstanding as, as, as designed mechanically and electromechanically as they are, they are, they have, they are the limit often to the thermal nature of the design of the uh, robot joint. So gearing considerations. Why do we need high ratio gears? If I have a collaborative style robot arm, and I have my worst case fully extended load, okay, and I have a highly dynamic condition I'm working with, the more that I can reduce that reflected inertia back to my control loop and back to the motor, if I have a 100 to 1 nominal ratio, I have a 10,000 to 1 reduction in that effective inertia that is reflected as a function of that load at the end of that arm. So high ratio is a, is a very important way to go. So the mechanical efficiency, the heat generation, system life, all these things have to be taken into account for these designs. We talked a little bit about the, uh, the insulation system and how it translates back to perhaps a 15 degree C drop into close proximity. What other elements are involved here? One, how about the encoder package? Oftentimes when you're trying to build close proximity joints, the location of the electronics, especially around things like encoders, You've got to make sure that you're not going to exceed the typical 100 to 125 degree C ambient environment that those physical devices want to, want to see as a maximum. The gearboxes typically want to see no more than 65 to 70 degrees C before they start either having breakdowns or have a reduction in the performance in, the enhanced, in, in what they, they do as specifications. So how do you get around that? Increase the thermal heat sink mass. Well, that's kind of counterproductive because now you're adding mass to your robotics points, every one of the joints as you go out. If you've got six or seven degrees of freedom in your articulated style robot, all that additional mass becomes problematic. Or physically increase the distance between. Isolate by, th by some kind of either thermal barrier, isolation barrier, or just proximity, get the encoder and get the gearbox further away. That defeats the purpose of having a compact joint in the application. So the perhaps more practical thing would be to reduce the maximum winding temperature of the motor. Well, we know that that's gonna impact our performance. Let's take a look. So if, for example, we make the assumption, and, and by the way, you'll see many people talk about harmonic drive 
type gears. Uh, I am not a paid employee of Harmonic Drives. I will tell you that since 1983, when I first saw and implemented solutions of Harmonic Drives, these guys are the industry standard for a reason. The fact that they haven't had to defend any of their IP on this stuff, realistically, because nobody else can build these things the right way, okay? And uh, Doug, you can buy me a beer later, okay? <laughs> See ya. So it turns out that this style of gearing, which was very, very well explained, and that's the first time I've heard Doug go through that presentation, um, this kind of application is critical to how we do this right. So even though that efficiency might seem low, in your head you're thinking, oh, I've got, uh, I've got uh, planetary gear heads. And my planetary gear head per stage might be a, you know, a 3 to 5% loss of efficiency. And then you might look in the spec sheets, and, and pardon me, you look on the spec sheets there, and the number seems very low by comparison. It is not. Because the real number here is what is the dynamic performance improvement you get, and the weight of this gearing uniquely qualifies it to be advantageous in this kind of design. The efficiency of space, size, weight creates the value for this kind of uh, mechanical architecture. True zero backlash. In some cases, depending on the variations that you might see, thinning down that, uh, the outer rings and all, you might see modest stiffness, but in today's advanced control algorithms, the ability for you as a control architecture, and by the way, let's face it, most of the robotics folks that are out in the space in the world today that we've worked with, they're not mechanical folks. They know how to put software together. They know how to bring together the advancements in computer-based architectures and high-level algorithms for motion control. It's less about, very often, the mechanics of systems. This is why when you have good, smart controls people with advanced computer technology to run them, we can stabilize these kinds of systems, even under the, uh, the, the relatively modest stiffness to try and optimize the weight and performance characteristics overall. Driving that kind of a system with a classic torque motor, which is not optimized for high-speed work, these kinds of systems, has been a challenge. And yet, we have sold more of these classic good old-fashioned torquer motors because the form factor works and makes sense. Just like we went through that case of T, the case of M, the application of trying to understand the dynamics of getting the best possible speed and torque relationship to the efficiency of the motor design, most of these conventional don't work well. So, what if we had a motor series that might work out, and, and by the, this is the, uh, the paid promotional portion of this talk. The, uh, uh, the motor series that was designed to match up to something like that, it's exactly what we've done. We've created a series of six frameless motors that are optimized for use with harmonic drive style, nominal 100 to 1 gearing, and we've taken advantage of a high speed characteristic despite the fact we increased the pull count in the motor. We've done some special things with electromagnetics. No, I can't tell you about it. Uh, buy some and try and build them yourself. By the way, we've had many of our motors go to China and other places. We then had our people go back and, and they'll put the motor on the table and the gentleman will say, we love your motor. Here's the one that my cousin made. It does not work. They look exactly the same because there is more about building motors, whether it's Max's motors, whether it's my motors, whether it's the gearheads you're talking about, it is the integrity and the, let's say, the secret sauce. Let's say it isn't just about IP. In fact, generally we tell people about what the IP is, okay? The simple stuff. It's the trade secrets and it's the secret sauce that makes these things work. So it turns out that I have a family that is optimized around a very high torque density, shortest and lightest package, optimized for gearing, with harmonic drive style systems, nominally 100 to 1. Optimized at, for 48 volts. One more. Optimized for 48 volts. Optimized to perform so that the motor windings do not exceed 80 degrees C. This is fundamentally the most important element of how we have changed the optimization for the design. Everybody else that wants torque in applications like this has always said, oh, give me Give me as much torque as I can get, and I don't need to worry about the heat. These collaborative style robot spaces demand this kind of, and by the way, you have to be cost optimized for a highly competitive market space. We've built, we've built five different frame sizes. 
These identify with the harmonic drive specific frames. And again, this will be provided. This is just a, a nominal sketch, a very generic design, showing the fact that there might be a joint housing, a harmonic drive style gear head, the frameless motor, various drive, feedback, and perhaps uh, braking elements. I'm not going to go into the specifics of it. I take the older motor that we've had, and this motor basically is a design that's been around since the 1980s. This motor is the same as the motors from five other ma motor manufacturers in the US and in Europe right now. The same physical architecture, basically because we kind of set the stage in terms of these form factors. It turns out, you see the OD, very similar. The stack length, we're slightly longer in stack, but we're slightly shorter in overall armature length with the motor. By the way, this motor is this size. This is the TBM 6013 Alpha. The motor I'm referring to here is the smallest of the special series. Look at the pole count. We go actually from 12 pole in the older technology to 16 poles. This is counterintuitive. Typically you'd think if I have more poles, my ability, my losses might be higher as we talked about. My steel losses would be higher if I did it. Let's take a look at what goes on here. So I have the ability at 155C, very nominal design, and I, this is faster than you generally go with a harmonic drive style gearhead, but I'm going to show a fairly high power point. 4,000 RPM, 290 mil, millinewton meter, 120 watts. This is what happens when you take a motor from a conventional 155 to an 80C. Look what happened to the performance. Whether you're out here at 4,000 or even if you're up at 2,000, which is more typical to the joint, these things, it's like it falls off the edge of a cliff in terms of performance. This is, the, this is what you see with conventional motor architectures. Let's take a look, the same, the same application here. There's 4,000, same size motor, actually slightly shorter, 4,000. Uh, instead of, uh, instead of uh, what was I, uh, 290 millinewton meters, I'm over 400 millinewton meters here, 170 watts, here it is 80. The electromagnetics of this style design have been optimized for low temperature maximum windings and still are out there with a speed capability that far exceeds. So as a result, in summary, you can see 30 to 40 percent improvement in a smaller physical package size. When you take the time to optimize and design around the specific requirements of the application. So uh, I'm way beyond my time, so I'm going to say online, we have the ability to go in and take 17 of our standard frameless motors, and you can go in and you can physically change the voltage, the current for the amplifiers, the ambient temperature of the motor application, the temperature maximum of the windings. You can actually do liquid cooling, and it will generate for you an actual speed torque curve based on your input parameters. And I thank you very much for taking the time. I'm sorry I went a little longer. You did tell me it was okay though. Technology has long been a disruptive force. During the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution altered the world profoundly and permanently. During the 20th century, mass production and electricity reshaped manufacturing, giving rise to large, slow-moving global manufacturers. Today, there are new forces at work, and they're changing the world around us, especially in the field of automation. Thanks to technology, the most successful and disruptive organizations consist of a small nucleus of people with a BHAG, a disruptive technology, and a laser-focused strategy. Today's innovative machine builders and robotics trailblazers are leaping ahead of the competition by thinking big and acting nimbly. As an automation disruptor, understanding what products to integrate into your machine is critical to your success in the 21st century. But with so many emerging technologies, chances are you need someone to help lead the way. That's where we come in. At Electromate, we spend our days helping manufacturers like you build better machines. This is why we exist. 
Electromate has dedicated teams made up of the best mechanical and electrical engineers in the field. We work in harmony with your engineers to help you design and build custom, high-quality, automated machinery. This is what matters to us. We are proud to offer an extensive catalog of cutting-edge robotic and mechatronic technologies, the combination of which is unique to Electromate. From the harshest conditions above or below ground to the highest accuracy and precision motion control applications, our solutions are unmatched in performance and value. No business is an island. There's no need to fend for yourself. Utilize Electromate's engineering expertise to complement your engineering team and get your product to market faster with less hassle. Our core purpose is to help manufacturers compete globally by building better machines using differentiated automation technology. This is our culture. This is our commitment to you. What's your core purpose? If you want to build a better machine, come talk to us. To learn more about what we have to offer, visit www.electromate.com today. Electromate provides motion control at the speed of technology.